Hello and welcome to Starting Points. I am your host, Jay Brenneman, bringing to you the voices of change in, our, in your community and our region. Joining me today is Selena King. Selena is the Director of De Development for L'Arche Erie. Welcome, Selena. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Jay. So, Selena, you're a, a Sharon native. Uh, tell me what brought you up to, uh, to, to this area. Well, I originally came here to attend Ghana University and um, just stayed in the area, fell in love with the place. What did you study at? Um, oh gosh, I had a few things <laughs> that I studied. Um, I initially started out as a criminal justice major um, and then went into psychology and finally just did liberal studies and um, stayed with that. I um, was a communications minor um, with social work and um, organizational leadership and ended up where I am today with that. That's a little bit of everything. So what yeah. some of those elements are, are de definitely centered on on serving people. Yes. Is, did you have a calling to serve uh, others that you, they felt that that was where you were heading in life or was it something that you kind of picked up along the way? No, I believe it was always like a calling, but it was something that was instilled in us as children. Um, just coming in the, the type of family that I came from was always of, of giving back and um, helping other people. Um, my mom is a pastor and a superintendent of a school district, so always, you know, doing stuff in education and with church, we were always helping people out. So it was kind of just something that I grew up with and it stuck with me and I enjoy doing it. So it's a, a, ser a service-oriented family? Yes. Is it a big family or a small family? Big family. I have five sisters. I'm the second oldest, so huge yeah. family. Yeah. Um, have you all sort of landed and, and done something similar uh, uh, as far as uh, human service or uh, volunteer or anything like that? Is that Pretty much. Everyone yeah. is pretty much doing something that is service oriented. Um, I have a sister that's a social worker, another sister that's also working in development, um, another one that's going into medical school, um, mm -hmm. another one in the health and human services field. So everybody's kind of Parents giving should a, be yeah, proud. Giving a, doing a giving back kind of job, yeah. yeah. So uh, when you graduated, did you have a feeling of where you were going to go uh, afterwards, or was it something that you kind of uh, found like the pieces kind of fit, fell together? Because you came to Erie uh, to go to school. Mm -hmm. um, was it your intent initially to, to stay in the area, or is it something you kind of fell in love with the area? And No, I had no intentions on staying. I was coming to do my four years and leave, and then mm -hmm. um, I got here and experienced freedom. You know, growing up as a preacher's kid, you know, um, I didn't have much leeway to do much. So I came and experienced all that Erie had to offer, the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I was a little distracted. So I'd actually taken some time off of school and then went back as an adult student. And um, so when I went back, I knew that I wanted to be able to take all that I had done before and mm -hmm. to kind of get out as fast as I could. But also I knew I wanted to do nonprofit work. And so um, with the degree that I had and the concentrations that I was in with the minors, I was able to put that all together to be able to go into nonprofit management. And Did you have uh, any kind of experience or uh, exposure to some of the nonprofit world or nonprofit culture in Erie that, that drove you to? to doing that? I did, and um, the biggest hindrance for moving forward um, to ha actually have a leadership position was not having the degree. Mm. And so I had to go back to um, school, get the degree, and... Able to go back out. with a little bit more focus. Yes. And, yeah, I understand that personally myself. Uh, so, you know, you go in with a little bit more knowledge of, of, of some exposure to what you need to do to, to f get to a goal of yours. Right. Um, so, uh, Larsh Erie. Uh, tell me a little bit about the organization, because it's, it's an international organization, am I right? Yes. Um, L'Arche actually is, stands for um, the ARC in French. Uh, we are an international organization, as you said. Um, we are in 147 communities in 35 countries. Um, L'Arche Erie is the oldest and largest community in the United States, and uh, we're a faith-based organization. 
we work with intellectually disabled adults and um, it's a community of faith. We share life with people with intellectual disabilities and those without. And um, the beauty of Larish and really like the essence of who we are is that we are able to have faith and friendship together and where we learn from one another. So individuals with intellectual disabilities are people that we look at as teachers. So we don't focus on their disability. We focus on the abilities that they have and the gift giving that they have that we are able to teach us something and for us to um, not put up the walls that we have every day that we may do with one another, mm -hmm. but to look deeper inside of ourselves and realize that there's something more to us than what we see on the outside. And as cliche as, and as I say all the time, fluffy as it may sound, um, that there's more to us than that and that we actually have to take the time to spend with one another, to respect one another and um, well, to that's, just talk. And that's amazing. What, it, there's quite a bit of history with Larsh. I mean, how far yeah. back does uh, the organization go? The, the um, internationally, international this is our 50th year. Okay. Um, and where was it founded? In Paris, France. In Paris, France. Yes. And uh, did it, where was its first, uh, where did it first go to or land in the United States? I mean, where does Erie fit in with some of the other? Uh, is Erie one of the uh, older ones in, in the country that you know of? Erie's the first. The very first. Yes. Um, and and in how long has it been in Erie? Uh, this is our forty third year. Forty third year. So not not too long after the the organization itself had launched in Paris. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, how long have you been with the organization? Uh, this will be my second year in August. I'll, I'll well, be with them. Tell me a little bit about uh, your role with Larsh and and what you do. Um, as director of development, my um, main responsibility is fundraising. Um, so I fundraise for. And why is that? Why is that important? I mean, I, often there's a lot of fundraisers, everything from, you know, uh, uh, bake sales uh, for local churches or Girl Scout troops, and but then also you see some of these bigger ones. And uh, tell me why, you know, why people should, uh, why it's important. Uh, what does fundraising mean or do for the organization? Um, for our organization, um, because we're pretty much a smaller organization compared to other organizations that provide similar services, there are a lot of um, services that we provide that state and federal funds don't cover. And so, so um, some of the program is covered by yes. state or federal funds. Yes. But there's a, a gap? There is about 25 to 30 percent that is not covered. Okay. And so that's the portion that I fundraise for. And what does that mean? Let's say, let's say if you solely relied on that uh, with that gap, that 20 to 30 percent gap, um, how would, would your organization be able to uh, be successful or meet its mission? We would not be able to meet the mission um, because a large part of that allows us to be able to give experiences to our core members, which um, is our word for what most places will call clients or consumers. Um, we are able to give our core members experience such as traveling the world. Um, many of our core members have visited Paris. Um, we had two that went recently to represent the U.S. at our international celebration. Um, and um, that money pays for trips like that and even for our assistants to have spiritual retreats to places across the nation and even internationally and um, even some of the services that the assistants have to do for professional development. Um, we would not be able to even function without the assistants to be there daily with our core members. And you say core members and you briefly said how you know you, the organization uses that term instead of clients or consumers. Uh, tell me a little bit about what that does with the relationship between uh, the, the core members who, who uh, are part of the organization and also uh, those uh, like yourself who are in uh, a leadership or management position and also how, how does that relate to the community? What, are, what exactly are you, is this something that uh, you're hoping to, to change uh, culturally within uh, the community and uh, tell me a little bit more about that, that because it's more than just a title. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, um, the core members, it's at the core of our mission. Um, it says that, you know, that we're sharing life with individuals with intellectual disabilities. And so it gives, you know, um, a sense of belonging to our core members to let them know that this is your place, this is, this is home for you, um, and that we are not here without you. And so really for them, um, it gives them the ownership of the organization. It allows us to know that um, we don't own them, that without them, we would not have a place. It also allows people who are not um, used to working with individuals with intellectual disabilities to see them more as a person and not to focus on their disability, but to look more at their ability. And it's really something that I have tried to do um, in any other interviews and even in 
writings and things that we do to make sure that people really look at the core member aspect a little more of instead of consumer or client so they can look at the individual and not look at what their handicap is. Now that that's, uh, I want to say it's radical, but it, it's quite a big shift and change because mm -hmm. um, often when we address uh, social concerns, when it's done at the policy level, it's done in such a way where it is focused on uh, certain criteria and saying, you know, basically, um, if a person meets these criteria, then they'll receive these services or they should receive the services or it should be done this way. And so it is very, you know, it can be very bureaucratic and you do lose the person in a lot of those services. And so, you know, it, it's refreshing to hear that uh, L'Arche has, has really been able to balance that. Um, was, was that kind of also for yourself? Uh, how did, was that refreshing to you? Was that something that you didn't expect or was it, uh, um, you know, what has that experience personally for you have been? Oh, it was very eye-opening, um, especially knowing people who've worked in this field before. Um, just an example was in our office. It's not called the office, it's called the hearth because a hearth is a place of gathering. It's where we have our worship services and all of our celebrations and community gatherings. And um, you know, our doors are always open. You know, you rarely close your door unless you're on a phone call or having a meeting. And the hearth is always open for our core members to come into. And that was kind of different for me because I thought, you know, I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be working and I'll see them when I see them if I go to the homes or something but they're always in and out. And so to have that um, openness and really transparency and welcoming spirit was really different for me. And so it really just fit in with the rest of the mission and it really forces you to um, have the openness and the welcoming part of the community that we have. And you think that helps uh, you in fulfilling your mission? Like do you get a certain amount of energy out of it? It does, it really, it makes you, we say it all the time, live large. It makes you live it um, to the point where I, I can't separate myself from it and say, well, I'm only doing this from nine to five or Monday through Friday. It's, it's an everyday thing. It becomes part of you to where, you know, it's not just something I can say I do, but people see that it's actually, it's evidence of who we are and what we say we do. Well, uh, Selena, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, take us to break real quick because there's a lot that we're going to be talking about. I really like where we're leading with this conversation. Uh, I think there's a lot to, to, to dig in here. And um, uh, we'll be right back after, after these messages. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Find yours at bedsider.org. 
Hello and welcome back to Starting Points. I'm your host, Jay Brenneman. I'm, we are back with Selena King. Selena is the Director of Development for L'Arche Erie. And uh, before the break, Selena, uh, we had talked about uh, the history of, of how you ended up uh, where you are today. But also we talked about uh, the history of L'Arche being uh, around for 50 years, starting in France um, and being in the Erie community for 43 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now you had talked briefly before about the uh, work experience being that you are very connected with the uh, what large and what you uh, uh, refer to as your core members instead of clients or consumers. Um, do you have uh, one facility? Is it called a facility? Is there homes? Or are there multiple? Tell me a little bit more about the physical uh, location of, of large. Well, we have um, one administrative office um, called the Hearth, which is where our um, administrative team is. Um, so we have about 12 staff members there from our executive director down to our program specialist and our fiscal and um, the rest of our administrative staff. Um, our homes actually um, are family style living. There are four core members in each home with a person who lives in um, and that's a person who actually gives up their life to live large and so they live in the home. Um, they do have time off away but they actually still work for large and they live in the home with the core members. So we have seven residential homes. Um, are they all in the city? Or no, three of them are actually in the city. We have two in Lake City and um, two in Fairview. What, where, where, the, where they're located, are they in a neighborhood or are they um, kind of out in the country? Like they're all spread out, they're all yeah. spread out. We have some in the down, two in the downtown area, one near Mercyhurst. Um, in Lake City, they're um, kind of next door to each other in a subdivision out there, um, one right in Fairview, not far from our office. Um, our newest home is right near that one that we just purchased recently. And then we also have a new component called family living, which family living is where a person um, welcomes a core member into their home and they become part of their home. So like our executive director actually welcomed a core member into her home. And so he's part of their family. So that helps us to expand without actually buying new homes or um, growing on that end and allows us to welcome someone in from possibly an institution or another organization to come and live large with us. So these are homes. So if you're driving down the street, walking down the street, or if you uh, own a house nearby, would you would you be able to recognize from not, any other? You would not be able to tell. Um, the neighborhoods are absolutely gorgeous. The homes are gorgeous. Um, and our homes are open. Um, we welcome people in to come to dinner and have dinner at our homes or to come by for prayer. Um, we always have an open house. We try to do one at least once a season at each of the homes. Um, and they're very open. They're welcoming. So. Um, and what's, uh, what's the value to um, having this, not just this home experience, but also having this, this you know, uh, uh, neighborhood experience, this, uh, uh, you know, not being set off on, uh, often when um, somebody needs services, regardless of their their age or, or need or whatever that might be. It's something. Well, there's a building over here, and you go uh, go there, um, even when you go to school, et cetera. So, what what is the the value or that you see, or what have you heard, or or what's the communities feel, and what's that connection like with having these homes uh, integrated? Well, the benefit to it really um, for our core members and even for the people who live in, um, you have a family. Uh, we've had a lot of our core members um, were from Hulk and um, just coming from that institution um, style living to coming into family really um, has caused some of our core members to thrive. People who may have been nonverbal or did not really have lots of social skills, um, now, you know, they're, they're speaking, they're thriving, they're social people. What does that thriving mean? When you say thrive, what We is... say thriving. We're talking about people who are taking responsibility for themselves, who say, you know, this is my home. I have a place that I can, you know, get up in the morning and I have my own bedroom. I have my own clothes. I feel safe. I feel like I'm a part. So there's some that. independence to it. Yes. Uh, but there's still that, that, that familial, that connected sense of feeling as right. well. Um, what you would hope or what you would consider to be a healthy home home life. Mm -hmm. um, I said it's a transition for some some folks mm -hmm. where they might be coming from an institution environment to a home environment. Um, is that common? Is that all too common that uh, um, when the core member is coming from an institution uh, into this or do you have some members who come from 
a home environment into it into where it's, you know, is the transition the same? We've had both. Um, we just celebrated some anniversaries um, last weekend. And some of those individuals had been with us for 25 years. Um, that so every year that folk. they're with, that the yes. core members are with Lars, you, you celebrate yes, that. Yes, celebrations are big at What are the celebrations like? Um, you, it can depend. It really is whatever the core member wants to do. Okay. Um, they actually make a plan for it. Okay. So um, it can vary from a house party or going out to dinner as a house um, to cake and ice cream or spending the day at Waldemere or wherever, whatever the core member wants to do. There are no limits on it as long as it's not harmful to them. Yeah. You can do. And they get this in addition to their birthday or some yes, of the other holidays. birthdays are big. It's Celebrations amazing. are yeah. really um, at the heart of large period. We, we celebrate big. We celebrate well at yeah. large. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of uh, goes back to the... Um, uh, the, the, the fact that there is a lot to be thankful for. Um, is, you said some of the members have been, some of the core members have been there or with you for 25 years. Um, is that the longest? Is that unusual? Is that pretty common that you have folks for such an extended period of time? Is, do they normally come in when they're younger? Do they normally come in older? Are these, are these mixed? It's mixed. Some of the stories are mixed. Um, our newest, one of our newest members is 18 years old. Um, and he's still in high school at Central. Um, and his story was that he came from a family that was taking care of him and the family member had gotten, you know, to a place where she could no longer take care of him. And so we welcomed him into large, you know, so his story was a little different compared to some that we took from Polk, you know, that they had been dropped off when they were children. And we acquired them when, you know, certain parts of Polk closed. And so they've been with us for 25. Some of us from the time Larsh opened, mm -hmm. and that was how Larsh started for us 43 years ago. And um, that's just kind of how the transition has been for some. And so for some people, Larsh is all they know. This is their family. And without Larsh, they would not have a family. They would not have a place to be if we weren't in existence. So um, it's really a special place for some people. And, um, you know, it really makes us different from other providers that do what we do. And... Um, Everyone's transition is not the same. You know, it doesn't always work out for everyone, but we've had more success than we've had um, failures. And um, we've been lucky enough to have people who've gone down to the Senate hearings, state Senate hearings um, recently, and um, testified to let people know that this style and this model works. Um, we've been hailed in the last year as one of the service agencies that has changed the world here in the United States um, with social service agencies. So, um, you know, what we does, we, it works. You know, I'm not saying it because that's where I work. You know, I've seen it work. I've seen evidence of it. And um, we've been recognized for it. And um, we're just hoping that what we do just continues to have an impact on other people and, and hopefully other people can experience it. So uh, you kind of brought out two different ways that uh, the that Larsh and the core members uh, reach out to the broader community, one being uh, engagement interaction with the public, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the homes, but also on a policy sense or an exposure sense to the legislators yeah. um, by going and speaking uh, to them. Um, let's start with the, the legislative or the policy or the legislative or just the experiential uh, for legislators. What's, what has that been like and, and how does that help for the remission and how does that help uh, the core members understand uh, uh, the where they're at as far as how important it is that you know because it, it's almost like giving them part of that mission too as core members mm -hmm. they by testifying or might be that's it's in a sense they're there to uh, to say this is important and you need to continue to this is why you need to uh, support it tell me a little bit more about that that aspect of it and yeah, we have advocacy as part of what we do um, part of um what well, we say that, you know, we advocate for them as, you know, the executive team, but we also, for our core members who are able to advocate for themselves, we let them know, you know, that we empower you with the ability to do that. So when there are opportunities for advocacy, you know, we make them available and we make sure that they get to where they need to go to do that. Um, so when the Senate hearings came up, we were asked, you know, do you have people who can go? And we had two guys that were willing to tell their stories, even though they were very painful to remember what happened to them at Polk. Mm -hmm. They were willing to do that and go to the Senate because they knew that it was important 
for other individuals to not have to experience what they experienced. And if they could tell their stories, that they were able to open up an avenue for other people to possibly be in places like L'Arche or another place that was not like the place that they experienced. Um, we did the Medicaid rally with Senator Wiley um, last year as well, just for the Medicaid expansion, because we talked about the, um, the threat to what would happen with healthcare coverage. And so um, a lot of our core members know, you know, if they're affected and their life has to change, you know, they're willing to fight for it, mm -hmm. especially when they know that we're willing to stand with them and fight with them. So it's very important to empower, you know, our core members for them to know you can fight too, you have a voice, but we're also here to be the voice for the voiceless as well. That's amazing. I, I can't think of too many other uh, uh, areas where uh, the, the members or the, the clients or the core members of any organization that's really called out to do or, or empowered to advocate on behalf. And it's, it's got to be quite a learning ex experience for everybody involved. Um, you also welcome legislators and policymakers into the homes mm -hmm. as well. Uh, briefly tell me a little bit about how often that happens or uh, you know, uh, you know what's, what, what that's like because they're coming in on the core members' turf mm -hmm. in essence. Um, it's been a newer thing for us, um, kind of since I've been on board, um, just because politics is something that I like. Um, but it was important to invite the people that you know make decisions for us and to let our core members know this is something you don't have to be afraid of. And that these people that are making decisions for you, they need to hear from you, they need to see you, and they need to know what's, what matters to you, not mm -hmm. just to hear it from me. Um, and it's not just a, a pamphlet. Correct, this correct. Is, they this need is. to see the face and hear your voice an experience, you know, obviously Larsh is an experience, not just something I can always just go out and tell people about. And so um, we invite them in as often as we can get them in. Um, it's just usually either, you know, dropping an email or a phone call. And so sometimes it's, it's been mostly at, our, at the hearth during something we call Chat and Chew on Tuesdays. It's at the noon hour, which anyone in the public is welcome to come. And um, it's really, you know, just lunch and we're chatting and sharing our stories. And if they want to come, we welcome them to be there and listen to us. and hopefully take back to their offices and to Harrisburg what, we, what we're looking for. Selena, this has been uh, an amazing uh, segment. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about L'Arche and, and the core members. If others want to get to know how to, or how to get a hold or learn more about L'Arche Erie, where can they go? Um, you can visit our website. Um, our website is www.larcheerie. That's L-A-R-C-H-E erie.org. Um, Are you on social media too? We're on social media. Um, Larsh, it's L apostrophe, A R C H E Erie on Facebook. The same thing on Twitter and on Instagram. And um, or you can call us eight one four four five two two zero six five, and we'll be happy to share any information with you. Selena, thank you so much. Uh, it's thank been you. a very good learning experience, and I hope others get the opportunity to learn more about the mission of Larsh Erie and the core members that you. Uh, you work with. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Starting Points. We'll see you next time.